Shalom, shalom, shalom. Mic check. <clears throat> All right. We'll be starting shortly. We're going to open up with prayer and then we're going to get um, right into the lesson in just a moment. Ah, uh, man, send water to the South. Like people in Texas, like in the United States, like in Texas, here in Memphis, um, I know Jackson, Mississippi as well, too. Um, they need water. We need water. Because after this uh, snowstorm, uh, a lot of places like here in Memphis, we're under a boil water advisory. So you can't use none of the tap. You can't use the tap water, really. And some people's tap water, like some people don't even have tap water. And then like ours, the pressure is real low and uh, and you can't use it. You can't use the tap water for anything. You can't cook with it, nothing. It's like if you, it's, it's like being in Mexico. Uh, like if you go to Mexico, you know how they say, don't drink the water, don't use it, don't drink it, don't brush your teeth with it, don't cook with it, don't use it for ice. It's kind of like that. And then all the like local stores pretty much are out of water. So uh like out of bottled water. So anyways, we're going to pray about that and um, just open up with prayer in general. Then we're going to get into the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you and praising you. And we come before you right now asking for those that are uh, asking for those in the United States that are dealing with water issues, lack of power, especially in the um, southern portions of the United States and other parts of the United States that got hit with this uh, winter storm last week. We pray, Father God, that they'll be able to get their uh, cities and areas back up and running again. And we pray, Father God, that also that you'll provide them with water and that their water systems will um, get back up and running again. And we pray, Father God, that you'll give the leaders uh, wisdom going forward to just spend the money to upgrade the infrastructure in Jesus name. And also, um, yeah, just, and also to just be prepared for next time to give them the wisdom also, especially in these Southern states to just go on and buy like snow plows and the things they need in advance to, so that they can prevent these things from happening. And we also pray father God for anybody else, uh, suffering after this uh, catastrophic event and anywhere else in the world that we may not know um, where they had an event and anywhere else in the world where they may have had a catastrophic catastrophic weather event or whatever the event may have been that we don't even know about here. We pray that you'd be with them as well too. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus name. And we ask that you be with us as we do this lesson in Jesus name. We pray. Amen. All right. Do to do, do, had to get serious with the prayer because <laughs> that water is a real thing. All right. So it's Purim week. Purim is actually this uh, Wednesday, um, our fourth day of the week, what Babylon calls Wednesday. And so we're going to be doing some history lessons all throughout this week. Um, Purim runs from the middle of this week basically to um, Sabbath. So today's lesson, as you can see, the title is Bantu Israelites, Origin of the Luba Lunda Kazembe. And if I mispronounce anything um, with, with some of these Bantu words, forgive me, it is not intentional, okay? All right. <sighs> And this one is basically, this lesson's shorter. Um, we have um, two other lessons we're doing this week. And the other two lessons are going to be dealing with uh, Eastern Africa. And those lessons are both like 60 slides. This one is about 30 slides. Uh, so it's a little bit shorter. But it's also a good segue into the other lessons. Because in this lesson, we're going to deal with 
um, Kilwa a little bit. And um, when we do the other lessons this week, uh, we're going to be dealing with Kilwa as well, a little bit more in depth. So this will be a good segue into that. And we're going to deal a little bit with Eastern Africa in this lesson too. But um, the people that we're talking about here, this is the area um, that we're dealing with, right? So you notice here you have basically the southern half of the DRC and like the southeastern half of the DRC. And then you have a lot of Zambia, but we're going to be dealing mainly with like the northern portions of Zambia. Um, can you see my mouse? Also, too, do I need to move my, I can remove myself from the side, too. It's up to y'all. All right. So let me know, too, when I put the thing up, I can always remove myself. But you can see my mouse. You see my mouse on the screen. All right. So where I'm moving my mouse at, we're talking about here in Zambia, this part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola over here, this part. And specifically with Angola, we're talking about um, Lunda, the, the provinces of Lunda Norte, I think it's called, and Lunda Seoul, and uh, Mexico. All right, over here in Angola, and in this northern part of Zambia, that's what we're going to be dealing with primarily uh, in the lesson. All right, moving on. So here you have basically another map showing you these three kingdoms that developed in their locations, roughly where they were uh, headquartered. So you have the Luba here, you have the Lunda here, and you have the... Um, Kazembe here, all right? All right, so in this lesson, we will examine the origins of three related kingdoms located in South Central Africa. And I have there in parentheses, so it's corresponding to Northeastern Angola, Southeast DRC, and Northern Zambia, all right? They originated out of the population settlement of the Uppimba depression in southeastern DRC circa 400 AD, migrating from Israel to the area via the Great Rift Valley route and Nile routes, all right? And so remember in other lessons, in other lessons that we've done uh, dealing with this migration of Israelites going into West Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, essentially Sub-Saharan Africa, there's basically four to five primary routes, right? And so, um, you know, there's a route where they went along the northern coast along the Mediterranean and then came down. Then there's that's uh, one route. So let me y'all can see my mouse, right? Make sure you can see my you see my mouse cursor. Can you see my mouse cursor? Look on the map. You see the map to the right? You see my mouse? All right, so if y'all see my mouse, all right, so that one route went along the north, the northern coast of Africa along the Mediterranean going that way, and then it came, then they would come down um, later, right? Then there's the other, going down the Nile, there was other groups when they got to Moreau. So when they got into like this area, they went west, right? All right, and some of them came this far down and also went west. Right, going to the Lake Chad area, um, going to um, the Niger River area, going to the Senegal River area, and um, so forth, going west, right? And the um, Gambia as well, going west. All right, so then you have these other two routes. So you also have going down, going down the Nile. Some of them didn't stop. I mean, some of them didn't go west. Some of them kept going down to down the Nile, like how my uh, cursor is going. And they went down into Eastern Africa and like Central Africa and um, the Great Lakes area of Africa, right? And so then you, and then you had others who went this way into Ethiopia and were in Ethiopia for a while and then also came down, right? But then we also talk about another route where Israelites came down and one primary, one, uh, um, well-known Bantu group that took this route that a lot of people know about that are uh, uh, Jews, the Limba, right? So like the Limba, they took this route and it's basically the Rift Valley, right? 
because when we think of the Rift Valley, we tend to just think of East Africa, but that Rift Valley really goes all the way up into Lebanon, right? And up into the Levant. And it's literally like a valley. And if you look at, like, you follow these triangles, it's the same, this is the path of the valley. And this is what they would do, right? And when you get to the, to the tip of, um, of Arabia where Yemen is at its closest point with uh, Djibouti, you're talking about like 20 miles, right? So you're talking about only 20 miles to go across the Red Sea to get from Arabia to Djibouti or to get from Arabia to Eastern Africa. All right. Anyway, so you had people, uh, Israelites migrating this way too, cross over from Yemen. The, the Yoruba, we have lessons dealing with them. If you actually trace their migration, they came from up here. And remember with the Yoruba, they're a mix of Israelites and Canaanites. There's some clans amongst them. There's some clans amongst the Yoruba uh, that have Canaanite origins as well too, like the uh, Ijibu. And I, like I'm like i mispronouncing it, forgive me. But um, going back to the Jebusites, and you have um, Israelites as well. And if you look at their origin story, same thing. Coming from up here, they say they came down, they were in Arabia and in Yemen area, and then crossed over the Red Sea. And then instead of going down here, with the uh, continuing down in the Rift Valley, they went straight to West Africa or went across over to West Africa, right? But in the case of the people that we're dealing with today, which is essentially the Luba people, because the Lunda share the same ancestor as the Luba, so they're a related people. And then with the Kazembe, they're really just the Bimba people, and the Bimba people also come out of the Luba. So we're really just primarily dealing with the Luba. This would have been their two primary migration routes to get to um, northern Zambia, um, southern DRC, eastern DRC, and um, eastern northeastern Angola. Right, so this route taking the Rift Valley route to the Great Lakes area and then going west are just coming down the Nile as well to the Great Lakes area. Right, so migrating from Israel to the area via the Great Rift Valley route and Nile routes around the 1500s after the fall of the Kilwa Sultanate to the Portuguese, a Bantu Jew prince of one of his city states fled to the area of the Up Pimba Depression. His sons went on to found the kingdom of Luba and Lunda. I got to get that thing to stop popping up when I'm doing it. Uh, kingdoms of Luba and Lunda. Out of these states, the Kazembe or Bimba emerged. All right. So this is from the Congo Wars, Conflict, Myth, and Reality by Dr. Thomas Turner, page 57. Candidates for recruitment and the stereotype of the intelligent, op open, Baluba was transferred to the people known as Luba Kasai. They began to be labeled Jews of Africa, like the Tutsi in Rwanda or the Igbo in Nigeria. There is a strong element of self-fulfilling prophecy in all this, since not only state posts, but also mission schools were built in places where people were considered most suitable. All right, so point is they began to be labeled the luba began to be labeled as part of this group groups that were known as the jews of africa right and there's a reason for that it has more to do with uh, with their actual origins which we're going to show you in this lesson okay let's move to the next slide all right so this is from um the peoples of africa page 345 by uh, james olson all right luba the Lubas, Balubas, are one of the major ethnic groups of Zaire. And Zaire is just the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's what it used to be called. Their population today exceeds 4 million people, of whom about 12% are Muslim. Uh, I would say if you were including even all the related Luba people, more so probably like at least like 7 to 8 million, I would, I, I would say. Uh, the rest are Christians or are faithful to traditional Luba beliefs and rituals. Lubas can also be found in Zambia. They extend from the Kasai River and, and Mbuji Mayi in the west to the Lulaba and Lufria rivers near the towns of Bukavu and Balundi in the southeast. 
Their social system is patrilineal. Most Lubas still work as fishermen and farmers, raising maize and millet. But Lubas also dominate the mining and industrial economy of Katanga province, right? And Katanga is a province in uh, Southern DRC. Luba states emerged as early as the 8th century. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Luba state grew rich from the trade in ivory and slaves. All right, notice here, it says Luba states emerged as early as the 8th century, right? So they already started emerging um, as states, right? Uh, around the 700s AD, right? So they were already becoming a political entity, right? And already emerging, uh, and already emerging as a sophisticated civilization around 700 AD. Okay, it says the Luba states emer emerged as early as the eighth century. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Luba state grew rich from the trade in ivory and slaves. Traditionally, the Lubas have dominated their neighbors. The culturally and religious related Lundas, Lubas helped to crush the Lunda Rebellion in 1961 and uh, Zaire in 1961 through 1962. All right, so notice here it says culturally and religiously related Lundas. All right, because you're, as you're going to see in this lesson, the Lundas are related to the uh, to the Luba people. They're kind of like how like uh, here with the Native Americans, like with Choctaws and Chickasaw. And now with the Choctaw and Chickasaw, like remember they both Choctaw's ancestor was Chata and the Chickasaw's ancestor, I forget his name, but they were brothers, right? And so uh, with the kingdom of Luba that arose and then with the kingdom of Lunda that arose, they were brothers and they, and they shared the same father. Uh, also here on this talking about with the slave trade, um, Luba's, Lunda, they were sold as slaves too. Uh, in the end, in the lot, and we're not, and the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because we're actually not going to focus on this a lot in this lesson. But in the 1800s, the Luba were, uh, that was part of their downfall, was the Arab slave trade and some uh, coming from the East, like with uh, Tipu Tip and, uh, that type of uh, a situation going on. And with the Arab slave trade, that's actually what uh, helped to contribute to bring it into their kingdom. So a lot of them were, a lot of them were actually enslaved and shipped in the Arab slave trade, but they were also shipped in the transatlantic slave trade too. Uh, one of the primary sources we're going to be reading from, they talk about that, but we didn't, uh, again, I'm not, I didn't focus on that in this lesson. But in that primary source, it talked about uh, how in the in the late 1800s and the mid 1800s, when these European explorers and missionaries and stuff would be in the area about how like anytime slaves would get freed from like Eastern Africa or somewhere and they were coming back into the Congo or like Zambia um, after having been freed they were always coming back to Luba areas and Lunda areas because that's what that was what was home for them. Right. So I just wanted to point that out, too. They were in, they were sent in the slave trade as well, too. So uh, that would fit them as well with the Deuteronomy 28 and uh, verse 68 would also apply to the Luba. Right. The Luba kingdom first appeared in the 15th century. It began to decline in the late 19th century because of the expansion of the Chokwe Empire. When Belgian colonial authority extended into what is today southern and eastern Zaire in the 20th century, the Lubas resisted ferociously, acquiring a reputation as a violent dissenting group. They are highly independent. They are a highly independent ethnocentric people. Ethno ethnologists divide the Luba. And remember, this is from a European source, so he's, you know, taking some liberties with what he's saying. Right, but we're just using this to get a basic idea going forward, uh, or a basic background going forward on the Luba people. Right, uh, that's why also too it's using this is the older source too. That's why it's saying Zaire, right, and that's why the population numbers are lower for the Luba than what they actually are today. But that's uh, that being said, that's also why this guy's language is a little. Uh, 
might be might be interpreted as offensive to some people. Right? They are highly independent ethnocentric people. Ethnologists divide the Lubas into a variety of subgroups. The Luba Shaba cluster includes Kaniokas, Kanlundues, Lamotwas, while the Luba Kasa, while the Luba Kasai cluster is composed of Luluas, Lundas, Benjis, and Imputus. All right. Again, here's another map showing you the areas of uh, where they emerged from. And then next, we're going to read here. This is another part just to give you a background on on uh, understanding their development and what was going on in the area right before the uh, Luba began to emerge. So we just read about how it said they began to emerge as a, as a state um, in the 700s AD. So we're going to look at what was going on in that area before 700 AD. So we're going to look at what was going on in that area from maybe about 200 BC to about uh, 400, 500, 600 AD. All right, so the next source we're going to look at is the Greco-Roman trade link and the Bantu migration theory um, by Felix A. Chamming. And this is from the scholarly journal Anthrop Anthropos, uh, 1999, and pages 205 through 215, okay? So this is the introduction to it. This paper synthesizes two aspects of Eastern and Southern Africa, African later prehistoric scholarship, which have hitherto been treated separately. The first is the spread of the early iron working EIW, our early iron working cultural tradition. The second is the classical trade to East Africa, uh, and they have their Azania. These two aspects occurred at the same time between 200 BC and 400 AD. And when it's saying Azania here, this is kind of like where you get the name Tanzania from, uh, Zanj, right? It's basically just talking about Eastern Africa from Kenya down to Mozambique. And um, if you're looking at it in the Bible, it was that part of Africa was in Cush's land allotment um, to Cush's son, Sabbatica, right? That was Southeast, basically uh, Southeastern Africa, okay? Um, the archeological sites of early farming and iron and iron using communities scattered over the Eastern Central and Southern Africa have hitherto been recognized as of early iron working industrial complex, all right? The early iron working people are also thought to have introduced iron technology and beveled slash fluted pottery to the general region. One of the major preoccupations of the scholars dealing with the archeology span of, of the early iron working period was to try to explain how the tradition spread over the larger region of, this, of the sub-Saharan Africa. Their explanation has been predicated on the theory of population movement. The classical trade to Azania is documented in Propelius Marius, Propelius Marius Erythii, uh, and it has there from 40 to 70 AD, and in Ptolemy's geography from the second to third centuries. Coins of classical times found in non-archeological context have also been used as evidence of the ancient trade. All right, so basically here, what we're about to see is that this part of, even the where the Up Bimba depression was uh, in the Eastern and Southeastern DRC, that this area was uh, fully integrated. Before the Luba state, before the Luba state emer started emerging in uh, 700 AD, that region was already fully integrated into the Greco-Roman economy and was already fully integrated into the Indian Ocean trade economy. That's what we're about to see, right? And when we deal, when we do the lesson about um, this week about sh uh, Shabbat keeping, the history of Shabbat observance in medieval Eastern and medieval East Africa, um, we're gonna talk about how like they've found coins from like, I think the 10th century uh, AD, all right, so the thousand year old coins in Australia 
that come from Eastern Africa. How did those coins get there, right? All the way to Australia. That means either Bantus from East Africa were selling there or somebody doing trade with them was selling there. And none of this should really be anything that, uh, none of this, let me uh, put this up. Hold on. And I'll, I'll explain to y'all in just a second while none of, none of that should be anything that uh, surprises you at all, um, historically. Let's see if it'll, if I put it up, if it'll keep it. Let's see. All right, y'all can see it. All right, I might take myself off, though, for this. But um, one of the reasons, or a few reasons why that shouldn't be at all surprising to anyone. Um, one, like, and we've covered this in other lessons we've done with the with some of the Melanesian groups in Melanesia and the Pacific Islands. Some of them, their origin stories say that they came from Israel or they came out of Egypt. And they went down to the Great Lakes region of Africa. And then they say they sailed over to Fiji, right? We've covered that and brought that up and shown that that's what they say. That's how they say they got there, right? Then even if you look at Madagascar, the Malagasy, with the Malagasy, the Malagasy are a mixture of Indonesian people, right? So Austronesians from Southeast Asia and Bantu people. On the, and those Indonesians sail to Madagascar. But that shouldn't surprise you. The Austronesians are the same people that populated the uh, parts of the Pacific Islands as well, too, right? Just like Melanesians did, just like uh, Polynesians are Austronesians. So none of these things should surprise you, right? And then they, we know the Arabs have been involved in trade and uh, all of that. But I think uh, coming from a, for a lot of people living in the West, you tend to just focus on the Atlantic and the Western world and not realize what's, what was going on in ancient times in the Eastern world, right? And so this part of this part of Africa, what we're dealing with has kind of always been historically was more oriented towards the Eastern world, okay? All right, so let me take myself off of this probably let me scroll down you say yes all right let me take myself off and make sure we're able to still hear me because that is what ends up happening can you still hear me can you still hear me Soon as the screen full screen goes, can you hear me? I'm back. All right. So this will give you a little background on the air, what was going on in that area before uh, before the Luba states started to emerge. So remember, the Luba started to emerge as a, a state entity around 700 AD, they started becoming a kingdom around 1500 AD, right? But let's see what was going on in the area and in the region um, right before that time. So from around 200 BC to up until about 500 AD, 600 AD, okay? And we're going to deal a little bit with Eastern Africa too, because that relates to the Luba because the Luba say their founding, their founding prince or their founding king um, who started their civilization came from Eastern Africa, right? Um, from the other side of uh, Lake, is it Malawi? I think it's Lake Malawi. All right. So we read the introduction. So we're going to pick it up from, and we're just going to read a little, uh, skip through some sections of these. Um, but we want to deal with it from here. All right, we'll pick it up from here and do some skipping. All right, a linguistic theory suggested the Congo Niger region as the origin of Bantu speakers. From there, they first, from there, they first occupied the Congo forest before spreading to the rest of the subcontinent. After an establishment of the second nucleus zone at the Katanga Copper Belt area suggested that the movement had two stages. 
the early one the early one being that of conquer conquering the forest and the second one being that of conquering the savannah while the earlier movement was seen as responsible for the spread of crops of southeast asian origin the later movement was seen as responsible for the spread of iron technology and the bevel slash fluted pottery. All right, so notice here they were saying the first part dealing with basically clearing out a lot of the rainforest um, was responsible for setting up uh, sedentary farms and bringing in crops from Southeast Asia. So like they were growing, they had brought in crops from Southeast Asia and were growing them. All right, this is in this, and we're talking about here in Greco-Roman times. Right. So from like 200 B.C. to like five to like 500 A.D. Right. They were already that much integrated into the into what was at that time, the global economy. All right. It was where they were getting goods and trading with Southeast Asia. What you'll see is they were also trading with Rome because they were shipping goods up the Nile. Right. From the Great Lakes region up the Nile. And we're talking about the Great Lakes region of Africa up the Nile and it uh, going to Rome and Greece and places. But we'll read about that in uh, just a moment, okay? Um, then it talks about how this second movement was, re was responsible for bringing in the iron technology, right? And that's talking about more near the Katanga um, copper belt, dealing with where the Luba would emerge from, right? The archeological data, let's see. Collected in the latter part of the 1960s and throughout the 1970s, did not, however, agree with the link with the linguistic reconstruction concerning the area of origin of the early iron working tradition. The earliest settlements practicing iron technology with bevel slash fluted pottery were founded west of Lake Nyanza or Lake Victoria in the highlands of Rwanda and Burundi. These were dated to the fifth century B.C. The dates for the sites of the same tradition appear younger and younger as one moves towards the east and south of the subcontinent. It was therefore established that the early ironworking tradition originated in the interlacustrine—I can never pronounce that—interlacustrine region. Small talk. They just Great Lakes region. <laughs> That's what that means. Small talk, right? Great, because like nobody who's not from there or don't understand like English and Belgian and stuff, colonialism talk is not gonna know what that means, all right? So just the Great Lakes region of Africa, okay? All right, if that comes up again, that's what we're going to say from now on. Where it had been established by the fifth century BC before it was spread to the different parts of the subcontinent, all right? Um, I'm gonna go down because I wanna get to the part where we're dealing with the Romans and then being more integrated into the global economy. Do, do, do. We're getting close. Is there a subject heading? All right, do I want this up here too? All right. Um, I'll pick it up here. I'm gonna pick it up from the subheading. Or I'll pick it up from the bottom right here, this last paragraph. So I'm gonna pick it up from here. All right, therefore the failure of the two models to offer a parsimonious explanation of the phenomenon that, occur that occurred shortly before and in the early centuries AD calls for an alternative explanatory model. A new model must help to explain how the tradition was spread in stages, but also in fairly speedy form. Before dealing with this problem, the question of Greco-Roman trade connection to East Africa, which provides light to the new model, should be reviewed. All right. Writers of classical, all right, so the this subheading title is Greco-Roman documents about East Africa. Writers of classical times have passed to us knowledge of cultural and economic links that existed between the Roman Mediterranean, the Nile, the Middle East, and East Africa. Data exists in the reports pointing to an early trade route from the Mediterranean Sea to East Africa via the Nile and the Great Lakes region. Both Strabo, the last, uh, and as there from the last century BC, and Pliny from the early century AD, proposed the source of cinnamon and cassia to the area south of the Sud. 
All right, and as there in parentheses, marshes of the Nile. The latter suggesting, how do I scroll up to the top? The latter suggesting that the spices were brought to East Africa from a long sea travel that took five years has suggested that the spices were carried to the Nile and the Red Sea from East Africa through central Kenya. A review of this problem now places the cinnamon route via central Tanzania and the Great Lakes region and then to the Nile. All right, so basically they just said that uh, historians from the first century AD and from the last century BC, so basically from like 100 BC to 100 AD, historians who were documenting how cinnamon was getting to the Greco-Roman world or the Mediterranean world. They said the cinnamon was coming from Asia, going to East Africa, all right? And some people looking at it today, historians looking at it today, say that the route went through central Kenya, then to the Nile and up the Nile to the Mediterranean. Others say now that it went through central Tanzania, right? Either way, the point is, is it went through East Africa going over to the Great Lakes, going over into the Great Lakes region. All right, uh, where were we at? Further indications that a Nile route to East Africa existed was given by the expedition sent by Emperor Nero in the mid first century AD to explore the source of the Nile and to provide military logistics to police the trade route. The king of Moreau gave a letter of introduction to be used by the crew of the expedition on the way to the source of the Nile. The king's letter suggests, and what happened here is they, they went down to Aksum. So they went down to like modern day Northern Ethiopia. That's as far as they, that's as far um, as they got. Right. But even then they were looking at a way in which they can control the trade. Because that's been a whole, that's been a big thing, especially with the Gentiles and the Europeans, is access to trade, especially in Asia, like in the in in the East, what they call the East Indies now, or back then during and during colonial times, um, since like the 1500s. But even back in Greco-Roman times, they were still trying to get control of that spice trade, that spice trade, silk trade, uh, on and on and on and on and on. All right. Where were we at? Um, the King's letter suggests that Moreau has some kind of relationship with the Great Lakes region, right? So it says here that that letter that the King of Moreau, which is Nubia, sent with the Roman dispatch that was going to investigate would let you, would incline you to think that Nubia or Moreau at the time had relations, had relations with the Great Lakes region of Africa, right? And again, these are things that shouldn't surprise you as well, too, because we've documented how they found uh, they found Egyptian artifacts. And I I believe it was dated to like 1500 B.C. I could be wrong, but I think it was like 1500 B.C. or 1100 B.C. They found those in the Congo. Right. So this shouldn't surprise you. And then we've done the lesson about how Abraham went into sub-Saharan Africa. Right. And it tells you that in the Bible. And then somehow afterwards, after he comes out of sub-Saharan Africa, he's even more wealthy and rich and has all this gold and all this wealth that he acquired. How did he get that? Where did he get that from, right? And then and at that time, we're talking about like circa 2000 BC. But anyways, I digress. So going on, it says here, also the resulting report was the trade route has shifted to the Red Sea strongly indicates that Marotic, Marotic Sudan had been obtaining some of its needs from East and Central Africa. And when it says Marotic Sudan there, that's just Nubia talking about the modern day country of Sudan, right? Before the end of the first century AD, the shift of the trade route to the Red Sea in the later part of the first century AD coincides with the control of the Romans of the Red Sea and the North, and the north of the Indian Ocean after their defeat of Arabs, and then being aware of the monsoon winds driving vessels to and from East Africa. Winds, drive, winds driving vessels to and from East Africa. This sea route provided more information about the coast of East Africa and its hinterland. Perpilius Maris Erythiae, 
was a mid first century AD trade guide for sailors and traders aiming for the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Most important to this work is the description of the Emporium of Rapta on the Azanian coast. Located towards the southern coast of East Africa, this was the last market known south of the Roman Empire. It had big bodied people who were agriculturalists. Arabs of the Red Sea, Arabs of the Red Sea coast had settled in Azania, intermarrying with indigenous people and speaking their language. There was, colonial, there was colonial kind of relationship between the two. Goods imported to Rapta included ironware and glassware. Those exported included ivory, rhinoceros horn, and tortoise shells. Ptolemy's geography of the second and third centuries AD has hitherto been seen to have confused the, has com, seen to have confused the picture provided in the Propylius. However, re-examination of the report indicates that Ptolemy has clarified the picture provided in Propelius. Ptolemy provided grid references for all the settlements and features of interest to travelers. However, the grid references of the hinterland features are not very reliable because they are based on the information collected at the coast. The only contradiction the two documents have regards the location of the island of Mantheus. This can be explained by the fact that Mantheus was a concept for mass of land in the ocean island rather than the actual name for a specific island. The lo excuse me, the location of Mantheus would therefore differ depending on where the information was obtained. Ptolemy shows that Rapta had grown to the status of metropolis. It was located near a river a bit to the hinterland. The East African coast was then known as far south as the northern coast of Mozambique. Comoro Islands are also known, right? So basically here telling you about the first century AD, the Romans had knowledge and interactions as far down the Eastern African coast as Mozambique, right? In the deep hinterland, a range of mountain of moon, of moon was noted to have been providing water for a lake which was the source of the Nile. Ptolemy's data included grid references, which puts the mountain of moon about 15 degrees west of the coast, suggests that the mountain group is Ruwenzori, Ruin which provides water to Lake Victoria, the source of the Nile. Hunting for its preference for Kilimanjaro as the mountain of moon should not be sustained. By the way, Kilimanjaro is represented in Ptolemy's report by Mount Phalangus, which is located on the equator near the coast with three peaks. Kilimanjaro has three peaks of Kibo, Mawenzi, and Siha. The knowledge of the source of the Nile at the coast is interesting to this work because it provides further evidence for a relationship between the coast, the Great Lakes region, and the Nile. Scholars interpreting the classical documents have been locked in controversies over several issues, including the exact location of Rapta. The majority of them have favored the area between Dar, Dar es Salaam and Rufiji, which is in Tanzania. Recently, Horton has suggested the mouth of the Tana River on the north coast of Kenya, right? So we can stop there, y'all get a basic idea, but this is just showing you what was going on in that area where the Luba um, developed before uh, before they uh, developed into a state. All right, let's pick it back up where we left off. And let me put me back up. All right, and that way too, we can do a quick look over some of these maps again. All right, y'all can see the, let me go, I can see, make sure we good. All right. So again, so we'll go back through these. So here, even here, when we're talking about the Great Lakes region or that word, I hate pronouncing enter, Lucasistine or whatever, right? Here's some of those lakes here too, where I have my mouse going over, right? The Great Lakes region, okay? And going up further north as well too, okay? So in that area. And the Luba emerged in here, in this area, okay? All right, 
for and I'm gonna put my you have the here more again Great Lakes of Africa. I hope y'all can see my mouse. All right, y'all can see my mouse, right? All right. So here, Great Lakes, one there, here, Great Lakes region. This is the Great Lakes region. Okay. All this over here. button again. All right. So this is from Encyclopedia Britannica Luba people. All right. And this uh, for Encyclopedia Britannica for the Luba people is primarily written by Mutombo Nkule Nsinga, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Religious Studies at California State University, Northridge. I made sure to put the author of the Encyclopedia Britannica article for this one to give the uh, Cal State professor some shine. Right, Luba, also called Baluba, a Bantu speaking cluster of people who inhabit a wide area extending throughout much of South Central Democratic Republic of the Congo. They numbered about 5.5 million in the late 20th century. The name Luba applies to a variety of peoples who, though of different origins, speak closely related languages, exhibit many common cultural traits and share a common political history with past members of the Luba Empire, which flourished from approximately the late 15th through the late 19th century. Three main subdivisions may be recognized. The Luba Shankaji of Katanga, the Luba Bambo of Kasai, and the Luba Himba of Northern Katanga and Southern Kivu. All are historically, linguistically, and culturally, culturally linked with other Congo peoples. The Shankanji branch is also connected with the early founders of the Lunda Empire. The Luba Empire was one of the most renowned African states. Archaeologists have shown that the area where the heart of the empire was situated, east of the Kasai River, around the headwaters of the, Lula, the Lualaba River, was likely inhabited by the fifth century AD. So notice there, they were already there around 400 AD. That's why we just did the thing covering, showing you how that area was integrated even into the Greco-Roman world, the Arab world, that they were connected to Nubia, they were connected to Kush, they were connected to Aksum, they were connected to Southeast Asia, they were connected to India, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean world already. And they were already growing crops and for trade, right, and imported like cinnamon and other crops that they were growing there and shipping up to the uh, Mediterranean world, okay? Then around 700 AD, they started to develop into states, right, and started to uh, become more politically organized. Then around the 15th century, that's when they developed into a kingdom or an empire, okay? Uh, picking this back up, the Luba Empire was one of the most renowned African states. Archaeologists have shown that the area where the heart of the empire was situated east of the Kasai River around the headwaters of the Lualaba River was likely inhabited by the 5th century AD with the beginnings of the empire emerging by the 14th century. In the late 16th and 17th century, most of the Luba were ruled by a paramount chief, Bulapwi or Baalapwi. And if, like I said, if I'm mispronouncing that, forgive me, all right? I just read it. I've actually not heard that pronounced, all right? All those smaller independent chiefdoms already existed. The Luba Empire was fragmented by Belgian colonization between 1880 and 1960. And the breakdown of the empire resulted in the development either of smaller chiefdoms or of small autonomous local lineage groups, essentially clans, all right? Luba literature, including epic cycles, is well developed. The renowned Luba Genesis story articulates a distinction between two types of Luba emperors whose forms of government were shaped by their own moral character and private behavior. Private behavior. In Congolo, Elamba, and I have, this is my part in here. I put probably of Bakongo origin or maybe from Mombasa, and I have their Congo wheel because. Mombasa was originally founded by Bantu, uh, Bantus and were ruled by a Bantu queen who actually had that name. 
But the point is, is um, some of the stories, some of the um, records dealing with um, in Congo's origins as well, too, says he was a foreign origin as well. Like that he came from somewhere else to the area. All right. The Red King and, Il, and Ilunga Mbidi Kiwi, a prince of legendary black complex, complexion. All right. So notice here the bad king was light skinned and the good king or the good prince is dark skinned. Right. That's how the legend goes. The differences between the two are profound. In Congo and Wambe and Wamba is the drunken and cruel despot. Ilunga Mbidi, and I have there for the Kil, uh, Kaluwi, right, of or from Kilwa, the refined and gentle prince. In Congolo, the red is a man without manners, a man who eats in public, gets drunk, and cannot control himself. Whereas Mbidi, whereas Mbidi Kaluwi is a man of reservation, obsessed with good manners. He does not eat in public, controls his language and his behavior, and keeps a distance from the vices and mudas vivendi of ordinary people. In Congolo and Wambe symbolizes the embodiment of tyranny, whereas Mbidi Kiwi remains the admired, caring, and compassionate king. Luba cosmology casts in Congolo's evil government in aesthetic terms. In Congolo is said to be the son of a hyena. He is so ugly that no one resembled him before or since. His red skin symbolizes the color of blood, and he is thus said to be Muntu wa, wa Mawa, a physical and moral monstrosity who brings suffering and terror into the world, an uncivilized man who lives in the, in the incestuous relationship with his own sisters. In Biddy, the black prince, so it's almost like uh, Esau. Anyways, you okay? Hmm? All right. Anyway, that's it's kind of like Esau. Where are we at here? It says, in Biddy, the black prince introduces the civilized practices of exogamy and enlightened government based on moral character, compassion, and justice. He is said to be beautiful and the people identify with him. Mbidi's son, Kalala Ilunga, Il who would eventually defeat in Congolo, is recorded as being a paradigm paradigmatic and sage king. The Luba religion shares a common cosmology and basic religious tenets with many other types of African religions. The Kaluba language does not have a specific word for religion. It has an extensive lexicon that describes the nature of the supreme being the supernatural wor world, and various religious activities. The Luba belief system includes the belief in the existence of a universal creator, Shaka Panga, the afterlife, the communion between the living and the dead, and the observance of ethical conduct as a sine qua non-condition for being welcomed in the village of the ancestors after death. All right, so basically... So basically here, they, they practice that Hebraic paganism or that Hebraic syncretic religion that I don't have a name to technically classify it. But basically what the Israelites primarily practice in the Old Testament, because the Israelites, first of all, the Northern Kingdom never, the Northern Kingdom never was uh, fully just keeping the commandments and doing right. And in the Southern Kingdom, Judah, they went on and off, but they would blend their Yahweh worship with idolatry. Uh, essentially, they would blend their Yahweh worship with idolatry and familiar spirits or ancestral worship. Right? That's pretty much what you read about what them dealing with in the um, in the Old Testament, and that's the same thing here with their religion. And when it talks about going to the village of the ancestors after death, that's basically you know how uh, in the resurrection. You know how we expect to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? You expect to go and be with your righteous ancestors. The ones who, the righteous ancestors who did right, that's where you expect to go when you die, right? All right. Not, you know, not rocket science. Among the most important components of the Luba religion, three important figures constitute the supernatural world. Leza, the supreme God, and Leza is Elohim. Uh, we'll show you that in a minute. It's the same, same thing. Makishi or Bavidi, various spirits, 
and Bancambo, and Bancambo ancestors, right? So you have spirits, angels, demons, right? You have ancestors, that would be familiar spirits, right? That's what the Bible calls them, familiar spirits, right? And you're not supposed to deal with familiar spirits, right? And then you have the supreme God, Elohim. In the world of the living, the main figures of Kotobo are Nsinga, the priest, the Nganga, healer, and the Mwintishi, the witch, the embodiment of evil and the antithesis of the will of the ancestors. Religious activities include prayers, praise songs, and formulas, dances, sacrifices, offerings, libations, and various rituals, including cleansing or purification and rites of passage. Besides prayers and invocations, means of communication with the divine include the interpretation of dreams and especially the practice of lubuku divination to consult, to consult the will of the ancestors before any important decision or to know the causes of misfortune. All right. Although the Luba notion of Bulupwe is rooted in the concept of divine kingship, No one in practice identified the king with the supreme god during the time of the Luba Empire. Power was never personal. It was exercised by a body of several people. Do you notice how when we read about that, the traditional religion, it sounds exactly like Old Testament Israelite stuff, familiar spirits, going to the, going to the, uh, going to the witch, going to the necromancer, going to the diviner, going to the oracle, right? Going to the, uh, yeah, I already mentioned dealing with the dealing with the familiar spirits, but you get what I'm saying. All right. Anyways, where are we at? Power was never personal. It was exercised by a body of several people. The Luba understood that the power of the king should be limited and controlled to guarantee the welfare of the people. Thus, the Luba Empire was governed by an oral constitution based on the will of the ancestors. Kashila Kaya Bancambo, a powerful religious lodge, the Bambuji, acted as an effective check on the behavior of the king and even had the power to execute him in case of excessive abuse of power. Another thing you notice is these priests, sometimes you have even like priest kings, but you have like priest judges. Like, so you have the king, but then you have this priest or this prophet, sometimes it's a prophetess, right? And she has special like, she has special or he has special sway amongst the nation and the people. And if the king is getting out of line, then he he has power, right? Like, remember how, like, with Israel, you had Samuel first, and then Samuel anointed Saul. Samuel then was the one who told Saul he's not going to be king anymore. And then Samuel anointed David, right? All right. Anyways, and then in the northern kingdom, you had Elijah and Elisha running around, uh, Anyways, all right, and there was others. I'm just naming like some of the, the more prominent ones. Uh, it was assumed that the king had to obey the mandate of heaven by governing according to the will of the ancestors. Those ideals of genuine personhood and good government had their foundation in the spiritual values inculcated by the Luba religion. So notice here, as, the, as they developed into a state and later into a kingdom, they had their own constitution in a way to, uh, in their own forms of checks and balances on the king's power, all right? So this is from an article from Face to Face Africa. Uh, and the title of the article is King in Congo, the Ugly Hyena King Who Terrorized Central Africa in the 1500s by Nduda Wariru, July 10th, 2018. The Luba Empire was largely non-existent until the 16th century with the emergence of Nkonglo and Wamba. Can I get that paper towel? The Red King, all right? And the Red King here just means light skin, the lighter one. The empire located in the modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo covered the Apimba Depression. The area was occupied by fishing people who worked on iron and traded palm oil. The intermarriage between the different communities eventually led to the creation of the empire. Legend has it that a man called Kiubaka, Ubaka, he who builds many houses, and a woman, Kibumba, Bumba, she who makes much pottery, married and had twins, 
one of whom was in Congo, also written as Congo Congo. All right. So to me, right there off the rip, I'm inclined to believe this traditional this uh, traditional story just by the simplicity of the names, right? Like that sounds like how that would happen, right? He who builds many houses. So this dude built many houses and established many villages, right? And his wife is she who makes much pottery, right? Don't that sound how it, don't that sound like how it happened to him, right? All right, so we can establish and give this one the one hundred percent seal of approval as fact, all right? Excuse me for a second. All right, moving forward. Not much has been said about Nkonglo's childhood, but as an adult, he moved with his twin sister to a land near the Lualaba River. He then bought the land west of the area, crossed the river, and set up his headquarters at Mwible near Lake Boya. It is reported that a prophet called Mjibu predicted that Nkongolo would not be a king because he was a commoner, and that the kingdom would be ruled by a Buluapwe, a paramount chief with sacral royal blood. Mijibu told Nkonglo that he should welcome the Buluapwe for peace and prosperity to reign. If he did not, he would never be king and would die a tragic death. The Buluapwe Mbidi Kului, or, Il, or Ilunga Mbili, arrived in Luba and Nkonglo welcomed him and made him the head of the army because of his skills as a warrior and a strategist. The literature from the time depicted Nkonglo as the Red King because of his skin, which they often described, which they often described the color of blood, earning him the name Muntu Wa Mawa, he who brings terror and suffering to the world. It is said that he was an ugly son of a hyena because of his terrible behavior. For starters, he slept with his twin sisters and bore twins, and then over time went against the tradition of royals by mixing with the common people and eating right in front of them. He has also been shown as a despot who terrorized his people and had even tried to kill his nephews, the son of Mbili, who had married two of Nkongolo's sisters. Nkongolo's description has been compared to that of Mbili, who was described as a dark-skinned and beautiful prince who brought civilization to the Luba Empire. After Nkongolo's death, Mbili became the emperor of the Luba, which then became two empires, Luba ruled by Kalala il Unga and Lunda ruled by Tish Tishibinda il Unga. All right, this is from my own notes. Eunga Mbili Kiowa left his kingdom, which is commonly which is commonly believed to be east of Lake uh, Tanganyika. Kiolui probably meant he came from probably meant he came from one of the fallen Kiowa city states. He came out of a lake where he meets Congolese sisters uh, Mabela and Bula Bula Ala. Contrary. Contrary to the natives, he was tall and dark complexioned and had thin features accentuated by his sharp nose, all right? So from their traditions and um, stories, this is how they describe him. Dark complexion, had thin features and, and accentuated by his sharp nose. I'm going to show you in a minute. That's just prototypical Bantu East African. Like when I'm saying prototypical Bantu East African, that's prototypical like your... Uh, Stereotypical Kenyan Bantu, right? Your Akamba, your uh, Gikukuyu, your um, Maru, right? And I'll show you in some pictures, okay? In just a second. All right, and that would make sense too because the Lubar Bantu and they said their prince came from east on the other side of the lake. The other side, on the other side of the lake, you have Tanzania and Kenya. All right. Um, going forward, doo, doo, doo. he wore a red feather on his head, and by his and by his princely garments, Mabela and Bula Ala and Bula Ala recognized him as nobility. So they decided to escort him 
and his suites to Congolo. Congolo welcomed Ounga and Bili to his court and eventually put him at the head of his army. Ounga and Bili was a military strategist and advised Congolo on political matters as well. He led wars in all directions and expanded Congolo's control of the land to create the Luba Kingdom in 1585. Congolo gave him his circa around that time. Congolo gave him his two sisters in marriage, and he begat two sons. Ka Kaala, I want to pronounce it right. Kalala, Kalala Eunga from Mabela and Tishibinda Eunga from Bulala. Eunga Mabili was a warrior, a hunter, and prophet. He was feared and exalted for his mythical abilities. He introduced his God, his religion, and culture to the kingdom. His fame overshadowed that of Congolo, which created many conflicts between the two. Against the advice of, Muj of Mujibu, that was the prophet, Congolo plots to have Eungu Mbili assassinated. Mabela and Bulanda inform him of their brother's plot. Eungu Mbili gives each of his wives a red feather and his princely attributes and instructs them to give it to his children when they become men. And they are... And, and, and they are to find him and show these attributes if they want him to recognize them as his son. All right, so they were basically essentially were supposed to learn civilization, learn the commandments, learn the rule of law, and when they meet him, they should be able to demonstrate that to him. But notice here, he gave them two red feathers. He had a red feather. We're gonna show you in the pictures too. That was a common thing. That was a, that's a common thing amongst the Bantus in Eastern Africa, especially in Kenya. And they picked it up from the Nihilitic peoples, right? Because the Nihilitic peoples are the ones who primarily do that, right? And the Nihilitic peoples, those are your, uh, like your Kalenjian. I always use them. I just use them. Like your Kalenjian people, your uh, Maasai people, your Dinka, so, and so forth. All right. But especially in Eastern Africa, a lot of the Nihilitics, they uh, wear feathers. And you have Bantu groups who are in close proximity to these Nihilitic groups, and you have a cross-cultural exchange, right? All right. Continuing on, um, but it'll be more plain in a minute when we show you some pictures. Feathers worn by princes and warriors was a common practice of the Bantus in Kenya, which they in turn adopted from the Hamitic Nihilites. Eunga and Bili of Kilwi are Kilwa, was a Bantu prince, warrior, and or merchant from either eastern Kenya or Tanzania who migrated west into the Congo after the fall of the Kilwa Sultanate to Portugal and the rise of the Omani Sultanate. All right. So let's uh, continue looking at this. So this is from the book, The Rainbow and the Kings, A History of the Luba Empire of 1891 by Thomas Reef. In Congolo's downfall was, was brought about by Kalala Elunga, one of, his, one of the nephews he had tried to kill. Due to the many conflicts between Nkongolo and Mbili because of the latter's fame, Nkongolo plotted to have his brother-in-law killed against the wishes of Prophet Mijibu. When Mbili's wives told him of their brother's plot, he handed them two red feathers to give to his sons, Kalala and, Tish and Tishibinda, when they grow up. Mabili then left Luba to keep himself safe. Under the protection of the feathers and the magic of Prophet Mijibu, the two boys are able to beat their uncle in whatever challenge he set up for them. According to legend, angered by the growing renown of his nephew, Nkongolo caused a pit to be dug, lined with iron spikes and hidden under a mat. He invited Kalala to dance in his honor. Mijibo gave Kalala two spears and told him to brandish one while using the other to test the ground during his dance. Kalala Alunga, dancing, hurled his spear at the mat. The weapon passed through it, revealing the trap. Kalala Alunga fled, determined to join his father. Nkongolo pursued him, but the nephew had already crossed the Lualaba River when his uncle reached his bank. Kalala was able to reach his father, who then entrusted him with a huge army. Under the command of Kalala, the army took over Luba's capital, leading to the escape of Nkongolo. His escape was short-lived as he was captured, beheaded, and castrated. 
his body parts were sent to Mbili in a basket. However, when the basket was placed on the ground, a termite hill quickly formed over it and buried it under a mound of red earth. All right, so here's a picture example. So this is a Kikuyu warrior. And that, sorry, I moved the thing and it made the slide thing pull up. All right, so this is a Kikuyu warrior with shield and iron spear. The dark plumes of the vultures stripped from the veins of the feathers and long curls are whipped to the tusks of the hair. They would also sometimes like braid and basically fabric the feathers into their hair as well too, right? But notice the, fe notice the features also on this person. Dark, right? Sharp nose, thin. This is exactly how they described, right? The, uh, the king that came from the east, right? This is exactly how they describe him. All right, I'm going to show you another, another example. All right, and notice here I have on the side, Oonga was tall, dark-skinned, and had a sharp nose. Prototypical of Bantus from the Rift Valley regions of Eastern Africa. All right, here we have an Akamba warrior with bow and arrow, all right? And the Akamba people, they're Bantus who live in Kenya as well, too. But look at this dude's features. Can you see him? You see the guy? Look at his nose, right? Tall, dark skin, right? And also sometimes too, uh, well, I won't get into that. So I'll leave that up for a second. All right. So the Makunga, the Makunga mask is worn along with a richly layered costume of raffia and bearded ornaments at funerals of title holders in the northern part of the Kuba kingdom. All right, the Kuba kingdom was another kingdom in the Congo, in the eastern part of Congo, going towards the Great Lakes region as well. But the reason why I'm bringing them up is if you notice, their kings wore something with a red feather at the end of it too, right? See the red feathers like a tassel, all right? And notice that that was introduced into the region by Oonga, okay? All right. Its form and materials comprise elements associated with status and leadership, including cowrie shells, leopard fur, monkey hair, glass beads, and red tail feathers of the African gray parrot. A prominent trunk and two tusks refer to the elephant, the supreme symbol of wealth and leadership among the Cuba. All right. And notice they come from the same uh, Kasai region, another region near the Luba, influenced by the Luba. All right. The Kilwa Sultanate was a medieval sultanate centered on Kilwa, an island off modern-day Tanzania, whose authority at its height stretched over the entire length of the Swahili coast. The story of Kilwa begins around 960 to 1000 AD. According to legend, Ali bin al-Hassan Shirazi was one of seven sons of a ruler of Shiraz, Persia, his mother, an, Abyss an Abyssinian slave. All right, so Abyssinian meaning she came from uh, what it would be considered now modern day Ethiopia, right? Also still dealing here with Eastern Africa. So we have someone whose mother would have been an Israelite, right? And father is a Persian, okay? Upon his father, so we have Ethiopian uh, for the most part was probably a Falasha, right? Or could have, uh, that would just be an educated guess. But um, here we have Persian father, Abyssinian slave mother. Upon his father's death, Ali was driven out of his inheritance by his brothers. And even then, when I'm saying Falasha, it still could have been Bantu too, right? Because they could have imported the, it could have been a Bantu slave that just came through Ethiopia, right? Because that was happening as well too. All right, anyways, I digress. Actually, that is highly probable. That would be highly probable based off of the time period we're dealing with. Because this is also, we're dealing with, this is also a hundred, uh, roughly a hundred years after the Zanj Rebellion. And the Zanj Rebellion is when you have Bantu slaves from Eastern Africa who took over Iraq, modern day Iraq, essentially. They took it over in eight in the 800s. It was a slave rebellion. And then they ruled in Baghdad for like a decade. All right. But anyways, y'all can look that up on your own time. But uh, so probably, I, probably a Bantu Israelite woman for a mom, but that would be a real good educated guess. 
All right, but the father was Persian. Upon his father's death, Ali was driven out of his inheritance by his brothers, setting sail out of Hormuz, Ali bin al-Hassan, his household, and a small group of followers first made their way to Mogadishu, that's in Somalia, the main commercial city of the East African coast. However, Ali failed to get along with the city's Somali elite, and he was soon driven out of that city as well. Steering down the African coast, Ali is said to have purchased the island of Kilwa from the local Bantu inhabitants. According to one chronicle, Kilwa was originally owned by a mainland Bantu king, Almuli, and connected by a small land bridge to the mainland that appeared in low tide. The king agreed to sell it to Ali bin al-Hassan for as much colored cloth as could cover the circumference of the island. But when the king later changed his mind and tried to take it back, the Persians had dug up the land bridge and Kilwa was now an island. Kilwa's fortuitous position made it much better, made it a much better East African trade center than Mogadishu. It quickly began to attract many merchants and immigrants from further north, including Persia and Arabia. In just a few years, the city was big enough to establish a satellite settlement at nearby Mafia Island. Kilwa's emergence as a commercial center challenged the dominance once held by Mogadishu over the East African coast. Suleiman Hassan, the ninth successor of Ali and 12th ruler of Kilwa, circa 1178 AD to 1195 AD. Hold on, the thing popped up at the bottom. Rested control of the southerly city of Safala. Wealthy Safala was the principal entrepot of for the gold and ivory trade with Great Zimbabwe and Mana Patapa in the interior. All right, so notice here now we've gone so as far down as to Zimbabwe, right? As far as how integrated this trade was in these kingdoms and all these people. Okay, and remember, even down, we have lessons dealing with Great Zimbabwe, those were Israelites too, right? And Bantus, we got a lot of lessons dealing with a lot of different Bantu groups. All right. The acquisition of Safala brought a windfall of gold revenues to the Kilwa Sultans, which allowed them to finance their expansion and extend their powers all along the East African coast. At the zenith of his power in the 15th century, the Kilwa Sultanate owned our claimed overlordship over the mainland cities of Malindi and Hambane and Sofala and the island states of Mombasa, Pemba, Zanzibar, Mafia, Com Comoro, and Mozambique, plus numerous small places, essentially what is now referred to as the Swahili coast. All right, and to put this into perspective, so basically from Mozambique, all the way from Mozambique up to um, up to modern day Somalia, right? So we're talking about Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, right? And going and from the coast going a little bit in inward and also some of the islands off the coast. And these were like city states. So basically think of like how Italy was before Italy became, you know, one nation. When you had all those city states like Florence and Venice, that's kind of like how it was. And the Sultanate of Kilwa, he wasn't like directly ruler over all those cities. That was just the most powerful. Uh, that was just the most powerful of the city states. All right. But all the other like Mombasa, they had their own ruler. Right. And not all these places. Only in Kilwa was it where you had this dynasty coming from the Persians. And then later it would be Arabs. In some of these other places, you have Bantus, right? Direct. Uh, and remember, even with the Persian dynasty in Kilwa, it was mixed with Bantu. The dude's mom was a slave from East Africa, right? All right. So anyways, going forward. Uh, where were we at? I think the last one is the Swahili coast. Kilwa also claimed lordship across the channel over the myriad of small trading posts scattered on the coast of Madagascar, then known by its Arabic name of Island of the Moon. To the north, Kilwa's power was checked by the independent Somali city-states of Barawa, a self-ruling arist aristocratic republic, and Mogadishu, the once dominant city, Kilwa's main rival, all right? And you had a lot of Israelites in Barawa too, and Jewish merchants, right? But we're going to deal with that later this week uh, with the lesson about 
uh, the history of Sabbath in East Africa. All right. Um, to the south, Kilwa's reach extended as far as Cape Corinthians, below which merchant ships did not usually dare sail. While a single figure, the Sultan of Kilwa, stood at the top of the hierarchy, the Kilwa Sultanate was not a centralized state. It was more a confederation of commercial cities, each with its own internal elite, merchant communities, and trade connections. Despite its origins as a Persian colony, extensive intermarriage and conversion of local Bantu inhabitants and later Arab immigration turned the Kilwa Sultanate into a, into a veritable melting pot, ethnically indifferentiable from the mainland. The mixture of Persia, Arab, and Bantu cultures is credited for creating a distinctive East African culture and language known today as Swahili, literally coast dwellers. Nonetheless, the Muslims of Kilwa, whatever their ethnicity, would often refer to themselves generally as Shirazi or Arabs, and to the unconverted Bantu peoples of the mainland as Zanj or Kafirs, infidels. The Kilwa Sultanate was almost wholly dependent on external commerce. Effect, and you have to think, it's kind of like somewhere like Singapore today or Hong Kong. You're just basically a city state. All your, and so you're wealthy, right? Because you're, but in order for you to exist, you're going to have to import a lot of stuff, right? And that's where the Bantus who live more in the interior come into play like their kingdoms and their villages, they were the ones basically feeding the people on the coast. And in, they were the ones feeding the people on the coast. They were the ones working in the mines, like their king, like in the gold mines and the other mines and trading that with the, uh, with the people on the coast. They were the ones hunting the elephants for the ivory. Okay. All right. Um, the Kilwa Sultanate was almost wholly dependent on external commerce. Effectively, it was a confederation of urban settlements, and there was little or no agriculture carried on within the boundaries of the Sultanate. Grains, principally millet and rice, meats, cattle, and poultry, and other necessary supplies to feed the large city population had to be purchased from the Bantu peoples of the interior. Kilwan traders from the coast encouraged the development of market towns in the Bantu-dominated highlands of what, of what are now Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. The Kilwan mode of living was as middlemen traders importing manufactured goods, cloth, etc., from Arabia and India, which were then swapped in the highland market towns for Bantu-produced agricultural commodities, grain and meats, for their own subsistence and precious raw materials gold, ivory, etc., which they would export back to Asia. Also slaves, right? Slaves. According to the legend, it was founded in the 10th century by Ali bin al-Hassan Shirazi, a Persian prince of Shiraz. His family ruled the Sultanate until the year 1277. They were replaced by the Arab family of Abu Moheb until 1505, when they were overthrown by a Portuguese invasion. By 1513, the Sultanate was already fragmented into smaller states, many of which became protectorates of the Sultanate of Oman. All right, and here's a map of the Kilwa Sultanate. So you see in the city states, see it stretching up from Mozambique all the way up to Kenya, all right, all the way up to the southern border of Somalia. All right, and here's an older map to the right. I'll leave that up for a second. This is the area Elunga would have came come from, All right? Do All right. So next, we're going to read from this is from the Smithsonian Institution Libraries from the Russell E. Train Africana Collection. All right, and we're going to read from "In the Heart of Bantu Land: A Record of Twenty Nine Years Pioneering." in Central Africa among the Bantu peoples with a description of their habits, customs, secret societies, and languages by Dugald Campbell, fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute. All right, so I'm gonna leave that source up for a second.
Again, we're going to be reading from in the heart of Bantu land, a record of 29 years pioneering in Central Africa among the Bantu peoples with a description of their habits, customs, secret societies, and languages. Dugald Campbell, fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute. Okay. Native laws of which seem to point back to an early Semitic origin dating from Arab or Hebrew domination or influence. A brother can inherit a dead brother's wives and goods and failing a brother, a nephew is chosen to succeed the deceased. All right, that was taken from page 49, all right? So notice here, native laws, many of which seem to point back to an early Semitic origin, right? And this was taken from page 49, okay? To give reasons for the 101 taboos of Bantu peoples would be as difficult as to provide satisfactory explanations of the Talmud or of the, or the old Levitical laws of taboo in regard to what may or what may not be eaten. I fancy the initial explanation of this intricate network of taboo laws is to be found in the undoubted Semitic origin of the Bantu people. When one asks, when one asks you, why is so-and-so taboo? All right, notice here, again, I'm going to repeat this. Is to be found in the undoubted Semitic origin of the Bantu people, okay? We follow, so again, the second time here, him saying the Semitic origins of the Bantu people, that the Bantus are a Semitic people. They are Semitic in origin. And this is if you're going based off of, this is going based off of biblical history, right? Because according, and not just if the, the Abrahamic religions, the Abrahamic faiths, whether you're Christian, whether you're calling yourself a Messianic Jew, Hebrew roots, whatever, Judaism, right? Islam, all the Abrahamic faiths. You have Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? The Quran goes a little bit off the rails with the amount of children Noah had, but we're not going to deal with that here today, right? <laughs> but essentially, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? So according to the Abrahamic religions, the Abrahamic faiths, if you're if, if you're alive today, you have to descend from one of those three sons of Noah, Japheth, Shem, or Ham, right? So you have Shem, the father of the Semitic peoples, Ham, the father of the Hamitic peoples, and Japheth, the father of the Japhetic peoples. Okay. So here, when you read these, uh, when you read these primary sources and these scholarly sources dealing with the origins of the Bantu, like when these people were going, like when these people were going living amongst them and studying them for years and years and years, they all pretty much come to the same conclusion, right? Because this is probably, how many lessons have we done bringing out sources? And this is a brand new one. This isn't one that's been used before. How many times have we just bringing out sources, Bantu, Semitic, right? Semit and when we did the lesson dealing with the Niger, uh, with the history of the word Niger, right? And how Christianity or Judeo-Christianity was essentially founded by West Africans and Bantus. And we can show you that in the Bible and with history, right? And remember how, remember how in that lesson, we dealt with how the Bantus are the proto-Semitic people, right? The proto, the proto-Semitic peoples, right? And how, yes, they originated in the area near Cameroon and Nigeria. This is talking about, we're talking about like right after the flood before Tower of Babel, time. remember, right? So this is just another source. This is another source of all the ones we repeatedly are always just bringing out. Okay, it is what it is. So going forward, that's why it's impossible. Like that is primarily my my ancestry is primarily West African and Bantu, right? Primarily a Khan, Igbo, uh, Malagasy, Bakongo, right? Primarily. And I have some Monde in there and some Timne in there, but that's primarily what it is. So it's impossible for me to be anti. How could I be anti-Semitic? Think about what I'm saying. And even though no one's ever accused me of that and never would because I'm not that. I try to get along with everybody and the Bible teaches, teaches us how to interact with people. So that's how I treat people accordingly. Right? I treat everybody the same how the Bible tells me to treat people. Right. But just saying. I'm Semitic, right? 
and there's nothing, and we're just showing you this factually. Like, I'm Bantu. This is fact. Okay, I have Bantu in me. That's primarily what I am, Bantu and West African. And when you pull up the deets and we look into the history and the origin of that, it says the Bantus are a Semitic people. So it is what it is. All right. <laughs> moving forward, moving forward. Where were we, where were we at in here? It says, I fancy the initial explanation of this intricate network of taboo laws is to be found in the undoubted Semitic origin of the Bantu people. When one asks you why is so-and-so tabooed, and that 55 there, I think, is, um, is the, a source he's citing from. The invariable answer one gets is this. You please, sir, please, sir, these are our customs, or we follow our ancestors' steps. The penalty for breaking a taboo is sickness and even death, plus the dire displeasure of the spirits and clansmen. So basically, if you break a commandment, the curses, right? You're going to get the curse. And very often, and also, too, if someone wants a copy, if you want a copy of this book to read on your own, let me know because you can find it online for free because it's so old. But it's one of those ones you got to kind of know how to, like, search for it to find it online for free because it took me a minute. But it should be free. Some places will try to act like you you can't find it for free or it's not for free or try to charge you. But this book is uh, online for free. All right. If you want a PDF copy, let me know. All right. A P well, really, I can, I'll send you a tech. The tech I'll send you a link to a text copy. Uh, the PDF, that's why I did it like this, copy and pasted it from the uh, text copy because the PDF takes too long to uh, open and download because the book is like super long all right uh very often the sickness on account of which the taboos have been imposed is brought back in a more severe form as a result of breaking them a man who breaks a taboo if it becomes publicly known is branded as a social outcast just as a man would be among arabs and jews who ate pig these old bantu laws are totism exogamy and taboo are as old as the mosaic economy, perhaps older, and strike their roots back thousands of years into the dim, distant history of the world. Even the modern educated Bantu Negro is, is as ignorant of the whence, why, and wherefore of much of these old world codes as the ordinary modern Jew is of the meaning of the collection of miscellaneous laws found in the Talmud. Right? That was taken from page 95. And remember, the stuff that the Bantus do traditionally is going to look like it predates Mosaic customs because, again, proto-Semitic, right? You understand what I'm saying? Proto-Semitic, yes, they also predate that as well, right? That's what the proto means. All right, I, this has nothing to do with our lesson. I just put this quote from the book in here just to give you guys proof um, about this because I say this a lot. But we never bring up quotes because we never deal with these people. As Hottentot and Bushmen are believed to be allied genetically to the Hamitic family, all right? Bushmen and Hottentots and even Pygmies, even though Pygmies, they're in the rainforest, and a lot of our Bantu ancestors, you know, intermingled with some of the Pygmies. I like to call them leprechauns, right? Just because it's kind of the same concept that they had in Europe with that, all right? Same thing. Hamitic in origin, not Semitic, right? The Bimba came originally from Luba land in the Congo, and one finds in their language and customs many traces of their Luban origin. The Luba language, all right, notice this here. The Luba language contains many customs and words of purely Semitic extraction. For example, Mimo, their word for water. This is accepting the final vowel of the word used for euphony, Arabic and Hebrew, e ohu or ihu, used interchangeably all over Lubaland, bear the meaning attached to the word in the Elbru story of creation in Genesis one. Tohu wa bahu, without form and void. From Congo land to Nasa land, the name for God is Lisa, or excuse me, or Laza. Excuse me. This is also of purely Semitic origin and corresponds to the Jewish name El Shaddai, God Almighty. So Bina or Bina, which means people of, Bina Israel, people of Israel, 
It is thus used by the people of Luba land, Bimba land, and other adjacent countries. All right, that was taken from page 208. Now to come to Lisa or Leza, the most widely used word for God and one in use between the Kasa River in the Congo and Lake Nyasa. I think we shall trace it, we shall trace in it a word of distinctly Semitic origin, which with other Semitic words and usages proves that Bantus were at one time in touch with and influenced by the Semitic civilization of North Africa. Lesa is the causative form of the verb Lela, to nurse or cherish. The root syllable is le and, un and unchangeable, whereas the causative suffix sa undergoes quite a lot of changes. According as the idea is causative, rel relative, frequentative, intensive, etc. Le or li, with its variants d and re, is the invariable form of the defective verb to be in Bantu, which would suggest the Jehovah idea of God, the great I am of the Jews. Lay contains the root of a mother nurse, and one hears a lullaby used to hush the babies wherein mother nurses baby for God. All right, Lisa means also the nurse, and this is a play on the Lisa name for God and the root verb to nurse. Now, what is the Hebrew name for God Almighty, El Shaddai? if not the Bantu Lisa, and as a vowel may precede or follow its consonant, that lay therefore gives us El, which is both Arabic and Hebrew for God. Shad is the Hebrew word for the breast, so that in short, El Shaddai are Hebrew, the God of the breast, i.e. the great mother nurse is nothing more or less than the Lisa or Leza of the Bantus of Central Africa. The story of the Katanga Luapula River North, that was taken from page 245. The story of the Katanga Luapula River northward lives one of the greatest tribes of Central Africa, the Baluba, all right? And the Baluba, so again, Luba, right? Who are of undoubted Semitic origin, all right? I'm gonna read that again. Northward lives one of the greatest tribes of Central Africa, the Baluba, who are of undoubted Semitic origin. The name Baluba means the lost tribe and their language and customs have many Hebrew affinities. Their name for an idea of God with their word for water and people and many other words and ideas show their Semitic strain, show their Semitic strain. West of and along the Western Lualaba River lived the Basamba and the Balunda tribes, whereas further south along the Lulaba on, bank, on both banks lived the Bina Kaanda, whose full dress name is Bina Kaanda Bamu Lunda Lunda Mpanda. The Teuton-like tribal name describes the origin of the people and has reference to the Tower of Babel story. The legend runs, a way back in the world's history, our ancestors were occupied in building a great tower, our Chamba, to reach heaven. While they built the white while they built the white ants were at work on their wooden pillars and down they came one after the other they struggled on adding pillar to pillar but the white ants were more successful than they and after years of labor down came their tower leaving them nothing but the long name by which they now describe themselves right and this was taken from page 266 right and I also have here he also documents how in the 1800s Many Luba, Lunda, Kazembe, or Bimba were sold as slaves in the transatlantic and Arab slave trade, all right? The Arab slave trade of the late 1800s destroyed the kingdom, okay? All right, so this is according to South African History Online, and I have a link to find, for defining the term Bantu. Bantu comprised more than 100 million Negroid people who live in Southern and Central Africa, ranging from Nigeria and, and Uganda to South Africa, and who speak about 700 languages, including many dialects. And they also go into East Africa as well too, right? So I have here from Zondervan's Compact Bible Dictionary, says Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, 
not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. All right, so notice here, Ham became the father of the dark races, but not the Negroes. Bantus are Negroes, right? So if he's the father of the dark races and Bantus are dark, but he's not the father of the Negroid, right? And the Negroid is dark as well, right? And the Bantu is a Negroid, then who fathered the Bantu, right? That leaves only that, right? Who fathered the Bantu and the, Negro, and the Negroid? That leaves you with two options, according to the Bible. Japheth or Ham, right? I mean, Japheth or Shem. We've already uh, shown that it can't be Ham, right? So again, Ham did not father the Negroes, right? So that leaves us with two options then. That leaves us with Japheth and Shem. If you look in Funk and Wagnall's dictionary, I bring this out a lot, but if you look in Funk and Wagnall's standard college dictionary, and if you look up Japheth, right? When you look up Japheth, which I just do it off the top because we bring it out all the time. When you look up Japheth, it tells you that uh, the descendants of Japheth are your Indo-Europeans, right? And you can look up in a lot of sources, not even just Funk and Wagnall. Most of your common uh, Bible dictionaries, um, encyclopedias, it'll tell you that Japheth fathered the Indo-Europeans are your European people, right? Are Eurasians. That's what it'll tell you, that he fathered, right? So we know Bantus are not Indo-Europeans, right? So then who does that leave? Shin. It is what it is. Like you either accept the facts or you don't accept the facts, but the facts are the facts. All right, and if you look at Zephaniah 3 and verse 10, all right, it tells you from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring my offerings. If you look at Cush is talking about Nubia or what is now modern day Sudan. When you go beyond modern day Sudan and South Sudan, where are you? Central Africa, East Africa, right? Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa. That's where he's telling you where the Israelites were going to be at, right? Also, think of it like this, too. Beyond even just, if you look at the other land allotments given to Cush's sons, I brought up Sabbatica. Sabbatica's allotment went all the way down into Tanzania. So this is telling you where you are going to find the children of Israel in their largest concentrations, right? And even other places in the Old Testament, it tells you, like in the book of Jeremiah, how so many of them went into Egypt and into Southern Egypt. Where did they go from there? Into other parts of Africa, right? This is documented all throughout the Bible. All right, going forward and we're almost, uh, we're actually almost done, right? So back here in the Encyclopedia Britannica, Luba Lunda States Historical Empire, right? Luba Lunda States, a complex of states that flourished in Central Africa in the present day Democratic Republic of Congo, from the late 15th to the late 19th century. And it wasn't just the Democratic Republic of Congo, it was like Northeastern Angola and Northern Zambia um, as well too, okay? Uh, the Luba state was situated east of the Kasai River around the headwaters of the Lulaba River. And the Lunda state east of the Kuango River around, around the headwaters of the Kasai River. A later state, Kazembe, was located to the southeast. Lunda tradition record no large or powerful states until the late 15th century when the warrior Congolo entered the region, subdued several small chiefdoms, and found a centralized state with its capital at Mewimble. Around the central state, a number of satellites proliferated. By the, 17th, by the 17th century, they had spread into the southern Congo basin, into what are now parts of Angola and Zambia. The largest of these satellites was Lunda to the south and west of the Luba state and surpassing it in territory. Its founder, known by the title of Mawata Yamvo, ruler, was a Luba nobleman who married a Lunda princess. The Lunda state expanded westward in the middle of the 18th century and imposed this rule on peoples living near the Kuango River. The largest of the Luba Lunda states was Kazembe, which was founded early in the 18th century when the last major expansion of the Luba Lunda complex occurred. Migrants from Lunda moved southeastward, establishing a capital in the Lupulula River Valley 
to the south of Lake Maruru in present-day Zambia. From the outset, the Luba Lunda states were indirectly connected with the Portuguese in Angola, who supplied cloth and other goods in return for slaves and ivory. The, Kazim the Kazimba Lunda, who established their state with the aid of the with the aid of Portuguese arms, soon were exchanging their ivory at the were soon were exchanging their ivory at the Portuguese trading stations on the Zambezi River. Kazimbe continued to flourish until the until late in the 19th century, gotta wait for the black part to go away, when it was colonized by the British. And I think that's the last slide, or is one more. All right, I think this is, a, this is the last slide. All right, Kazembe, historical kingdom Africa, right? Kazembe, also spelled with a C, the largest and most highly organized of the Lunda kingdoms in Central Africa, and the title of all its rulers. At the height of its power, circa 1800 AD, Kazembe occupied almost all of the territory now included in the Katanga region of Congo, the DRC, and in northern Zambia, apparently created about 1740 by an exploring party from western Lunda. The kingdom rapidly increased in size and influence through the conquest and annexation of neighboring states. After 1850, however, Disputed succession led to civil war, and the kingdom was finally destroyed about 1890 by attacks from eastern tribes. During the existence of the Kazembe, there were nine kings with the name Kazembe. The greatest of these was Kazembe II, known as Kanimbo, who reigned from 1740 to 1760 AD, who conquered most of the territory that the kingdom eventually occupied extending citizenship to those he conquered and establishing the complicated network of tribute and trade that held the vast kingdom together. His grandson, Kazembe IV, known as Kabingo Kaleka, reigned from 1805 to 1850 AD, encouraged contacts with Portuguese traders from Angola, and Kazembe became an important center of trade between the peoples in the Central African interior and the Portuguese and Arabs on the eastern coast. All right, and that is the last slide. All right, so thanks for enjoying this history lesson and following along. We're going to be doing a couple more this week uh, during Purim week. Um, so on the fifth day of the week, which is Thursday at 7 p.m., we're going to be doing a lesson on the Jews and Jews in ancient and medieval Nubia. And then on the sixth day of the week or Friday at noon, we're going to be doing a lesson on the history of Shabbat in medieval Eastern Africa. And um, we're going to be showing you that in that lesson, we're going to be dealing with how keeping Sabbath was common in Eastern Africa at the time, right? In Ethiopia, Kenyan, Somalia. And when we say common, in some places in East Africa, keeping Sabbath, that's what the majority of people were doing. And in other parts of East Africa, that's what a minority of the population was doing. But the whole point is, is the concept of keeping Sabbath was not foreign to East Africa at all during medieval times. It was actually quite common. And you had non-Semitic uh, non groups keeping it as well, too. You had some Cushitic groups keeping it. And you had um, like the Agua. And you had some, um, you had even some uh, nihilitic groups. But anyways, we'll deal with that later this week. So I hope you were blessed with this lesson. Shalom, and I will see you all later. And